Father in heaven, you have told us in your word that you are able to make all grace abound to us so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, we may abound in every good work. And so we're trusting you for the good works of this evening, both in the delivery of the word, the receiving of the word, and the acting on the word. And I'm asking you, Father, that you would call out from the thousands who are among us in this event, call out a thousand people to go to the unreached peoples of the world with the best news in all the world. So come, you told us to pray to the Lord of the harvest that you would send forth laborers and that's what we are doing and acting on it. I ask this in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Last week, perhaps others of you along with me watched an interview with the brother of two of the men who were beheaded among the 21 in Libya, Egyptian Christians, and this interview was being held on SAT7, an Arabic Christian broadcast network, and I want to read you just an excerpt from what the brother of two of the slain said. I am proud of them. They make me walk, raising my head up in pride. ISIS helped us strengthen our faith. I thank ISIS that they didn't cut the audio so we could hear them. Believe me when I tell you that the people here are happy and congratulating one another. 36 hours later, the Egyptian Bible Society had printed a tract, a little brochure called Two Rows by the Sea. You can picture them, an orange row and a black row. And when I checked last, 1.7 million of those had been distributed. This is the largest Bible effort distribution, I think, in the history of Egypt flowing out from the loss of those 21 believers. So that's what it means to be undaunted by the darkness. Hooded killers cut off the heads of 21 Christians for being Christians. And the response, families say, ISIS have helped us strengthen our faith and the Bible Society prints two million tracts. If you've been watching on the social media in the last weeks, we've been posting these little two-minute videos of what our anticipation and hope is for this event. Every one of those little videos begins with a black screen with these words on it. I love these words. Cross exists to mobilize students for the most dangerous and loving cause in the universe rescuing people from eternal suffering and bringing them into everlasting joy of friendship with Jesus. I love those words. They capture it so well. So we are about students or people in around about that age range. We are about risk in view of the increasingly obvious <coughs> dangers we are about love for people who have no access to the best news in all the world. And we are about rescuing people from eternal suffering. And we are about bringing people in to everlasting joy in friendship with Jesus, the best kind of joy that there is in the universe because it's joy connected with the creator and the sustainer and the redeemer of the world. That's who we are. That's what we're 
about. There isn't any greater cause or any greater calling in the world. There are other callings and there are other great causes and great callings. We didn't plan it this way, but God did that February 27 would be the speak out for those in slavery, the end it movement. We didn't plan this. God did. What's that about? What's that providential juxtaposition of a cross event bent on bringing people out of eternal ruin into everlasting joy with Jesus and the end it movement, bringing people out of slavery of every kind on the planet into wholeness of life. What, what does that mean? It is the most happy juxtaposition. This, this coalition of, you can go on, just type it into Google, end it, and find out who the partners are. They exist to bring awareness, prevention, rescue, restoration to 27 million people trapped in slavery. This is a great cause. There are other great causes, other great callings. Every life lived in love and justice for the rescuing of people from any kind of suffering in the name of Jesus with a view to it leading them into deliverance from eternal suffering is a great life lived. If you gave yourself to this in the name of Jesus, you will have lived a great life. There are many other great causes. Christians are people who have died and have been raised with Christ. Our lives are hidden with Christ in God. We are people who live in this world and live in another world. We live in this age that is passing away and we live in an age to come that will never end. And therefore, we have bodies in this world and therefore feel everything everybody else feels. And we have hearts in two worlds, this world and the next world. Therefore, we can feel the suffering there when people are split forever from Jesus in eternal suffering or given to Jesus in eternal joy. We know that. We know this. And therefore, we know these causes are real. These causes are powerful. And these causes are precious. There are other great causes. But here's my conviction. Test this and see if you agree. I believe that every great, eternally significant cause of fighting pain and fighting suffering and fighting everything negative in the world, every eternally significant cause is rooted in a passion for joy in Jesus and aiming toward an everlasting passion for joy in Jesus. And to the degree that any movement loses its rooting in the cross, loses its, its, its reaching for everlasting joy for people, it has lost its soul. So there are magnificent causes in the world. I love to say, we as a cross gathering love to say, Christians are people who care about all suffering, especially eternal suffering. And therefore, if you live your life devoted to any effort to relieve people of suffering in a loving and just way in the name of Jesus, in the hopes, in the hopes that it will direct people to the gospel where they will be rescued from eternal suffering and brought into everlasting joy and friendship with Jesus, you will have lived a great life, whatever the cost. But I, I am 
totally committed to saying, I want to be a part of Cross because I am explicitly aiming to recruit people for risking their lives to take the message of Christ to the unreached peoples of the world. And here's one of the ways I think about it. I love, I love this movement. Unashamedly do I lift this up before the thousands of us who are watching this. I hate sex trafficking and all of its other kind of attendant evils. And I'm so thankful that thousands of people are pouring out their lives in all the ways of prevention and rescue and reparation. I am so thankful. But, but here's also what I know. There are massive Christian impulses driving this thing. Massive, glorious Christian impulses driving this thing. And therefore, this movement or any other worthy movement can get zero attraction among the unreached because there isn't any Christian impulse there. There isn't any Christian gospel there. There isn't any Christian teaching there. There isn't any Christian gospel there. There isn't any Christian hope there. There is no traction, which means that I think about frontier missionary labors, frontier missions as transporting the possibilities of every transformative movement imaginable. Transporting from one people where it's taken root to another people where it has no roots at all, the, the seedbed for hundreds and hundreds of wonderful things in this life and the next that can get no root there because there's no gospel impulse there. There's no gospel ground there. There's no presupposition at all for such things to take root in. And so I, I love serving every transformative movement by reaching the unreached peoples of the world where they can get no traction until the gospel gets there. My title is Undaunted by the Darkness Invincible joy for the sake of the nations. And we're already into it in this long introduction. Darkness. Colossians 1.13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Apart from faith in Jesus, this world lies under Darkness. Shrouded in darkness the entire world. Ephesians 6, 12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities. I'm sorry. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. So it doesn't matter how glitzy the Oscars are. It doesn't matter how extravagant the halftime at the Super Bowl is. It doesn't matter how bright and cheerful Apple stores are and Microsoft. Imitation, though it is. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Those who have eyes to see, opened by the Holy Spirit, informed by the Scriptures, know darkness rests over everything apart from Jesus. Paul said, Christ gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. John says, we know that the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. So when the title says, undaunted by the darkness, it's not a local thing and it's not a recent 
thing. It's global, and it's since Adam and Eve fell. And you need the Holy Spirit, and you need a mind transformed by this book in order to see that the bright, glitzy world is dark. The meaning of the coming of Christ is that the Son of God came into the world, lived a perfect life, died for sinners in order to penetrate the darkness with light. So he says, John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Christians are people whose blindness, inbred, native, firstborn blindness, has been overcome so that we see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, the image of God. God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And so we who have seen the light now are to be the light, Jesus said. At that time, you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, Ephesians 5, 8. You are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. And since you are not of the darkness, but of the light, you're called to be the light. And then comes this amazing commission that Jesus gives to Paul on the Damascus Road. It has gripped me in the last three months because it's telling Paul to do what he cannot do and telling you to do what you cannot do. He said, I am sending you, this is Acts 26, 17 and 18, I am sending you to open their eyes that they might turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they might receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's what I'm asking God to do is to send people like that. We are sending you to open the eyes of the blind sending you so that people would turn from darkness to light, turn from Satan to God, find a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's a place delivered from everlasting destruction and brought into everlasting joy in friendship with Jesus. He is coming to finish this work and to be the bright and glorious God that we know him to be. I don't anticipate that the light will be unembattled before Jesus comes. I think it will be a battle all the way to the day of the Lord. And one of the reasons I think that is because of this promise in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted when Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Or chapter two of Seth. Second Thessalonians, the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. So we penetrate the darkness with the gospel light and we keep penetrating and we keep penetrating until the day when the Lord steps forth from his hiddenness and finishes the work by vindicating his people 
and casting out all darkness. So we are undaunted by the darkness. It will have its appointed end. That's the first part of my title, undaunted by the darkness. There's plenty of it. You are the children of light, and you are called to be the light of the world, Matthew 5, 14. And when it's time, the light steps forth from heaven and finishes brightening the world completely. Second part of the title, invincible joy for the sake of the nations. So undaunted by the darkness, invincible joy, invincible joy for the sake of the nations. Which means simply, Christian joy, the Christian joy of friendship with Jesus, knowing Jesus, being satisfied with Jesus, saved by Jesus, loved by Jesus, united to Jesus, brought into friendship and everlasting union with Jesus. That joy is the invincible energy and goal, energy and end of frontier missions. That's the rest of my message. Christian joy is the energy and the end of frontier missions. So let's take those one at a time. The goal or the end. How is Christian joy, joy of friendship with Jesus, the goal of missions? So here's, here's the fullness of time and the angels appear to the shepherds. An angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. The note sounded, the the banner waved over the incarnation from the beginning is, the meaning here is great joy. That's what's coming into the world. That's what God, the great missionary, is sending, and that's what you are to take now. This is good news of great joy. So here it comes. That's the meaning. Great joy is the meaning. Then, when Jesus comes into his ministry, opens his mouth, and for, for three years preaches and teaches, what does he say about his words? These things I have spoken to you that my joy might be in you and your joy might be full. That's simply staggering. The joy of the Son of God becoming your joy. That's worth many hours of meditation and much life transformation. I have spoken these things to you. This exists so that the joy that the Son of God has had in the Father, infinitely so forever and ever, might be the joy with which you enjoy God. You're not left to come up with joy on your own. You're not left to say, well, I grew up in a home where I wasn't very happy, so my capacities for emotional engagement with God are small. You are told that through these words, God has ordained that the joy of Christ would become your joy, that my joy might be in them and that their joy might be full. And then what happens? He dies for sinners, and Peter says, he suffered once the sins of the righteous for the unrighteous that he might bring us to God. The psalmist puts it like this, I will go to God, to God, my exceeding joy. So incarnation, steady state teaching, death and resurrection, all of it that we might know great joy. That was the point of the incarnation. That was the point of the teaching. That was the point of the death and resurrection so that the 
people of God might come into the joy of God in God. That is what the psalmists say we take to the nations. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. Psalm 47 or Psalm 67. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Our, our mission is to call the nations to joy. Shout for joy, all nations. Be glad in God. That's our message. Paul, this has meant so much to me over the years. I mean, there are a few things that, get, that gave me a pastoral sense of significance than to believe what Paul said in these next two passages. Namely, 2 Corinthians 1.24 and Philippians 1.25. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we are workers with you for your joy. I love to stand up in front of this group, all of you watching, I love to stand up in front of you and say, I'm here for your joy, and have a biblical verse that just says it. Like, I'm not making this up. This is why pastors, this is why missionaries exist. Not that we lord it over your faith. We are workers with you for your joy. That's 2 Corinthians 1.24. Here's Philippians 1.25. Here's Paul wrestling with whether he should prefer to die and go to be with Jesus because that would be far better, he says, or to stay on the planet, serve the churches. And how does he decide? He decides like this. To remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you for your progress and joy of faith. I'm on the planet for your joy. That's what he said. I mean, think of it. The apostle defined his reason for being as the joy of the Philippians. From those texts, I conclude, so you've got angels saying that the incarnation is about a great joy. You have Jesus saying, all my teaching is about getting my joy into you for your joy. You have Peter saying, he died and wrote against to God, to God our exceeding joy. You have the psalmist saying, tell the nations to be glad in me. And you have Paul saying, I do all my work, not to lord it over you, but that you might Rejoice in the Lord. You have all that from which I infer the first point of my second half of the title, namely, the goal of missions is joy. I mean, it's just Bible. It's joy. The joy we bring, ponder this with me. I was thinking with Kevin in the car about this to try to get a handle on it. The joy we bring to the nations is not only a longer joy than any joy they could have anywhere else, namely forever. <laughs> In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures for forevermore. They can't beat that in terms of duration. Can they beat it in terms of quality? Do we just offer them a longer joy? Or do we offer them a better joy? I think we offer them both a longer and a better. First, because the Bible says so, you have put more joy in my heart than they have when all their grain and wine abound, Psalm 4. But here's, my, here's why I think that's true. You test this, because this is kind of fresh for me. I was just kind of thinking about it recently, asking myself, why? Why, why do I think it's better? Um, I think it's better because our deepest and highest joys, and I think you could talk with your unbelieving friends about this, our deepest and highest joys are in persons, not things. You have to talk about that because they say, whoa, I kind of like sex. I like pornography. I like 
drink. I like food. I, I, like, I like a lot of things. I, I get a lot of pleasure out of a lot of things. I say, yeah, me too, me too. I, I get that. But what, 90% of the songs that have been sung in the last 100 years on the radio are love songs, right? Now, if you analyze love songs, wouldn't, wouldn't, you, wouldn't most all unbelievers and believers agree with each other that to the degree that a love song degenerates to singing about orgasm is losing something? Whereas if, if the song rises to take sexuality up into persons, I mean, sex is not just a, a, a buzz, like a, it's, there are people involved, and, and the, the deepest, richest joys are when you don't lose that. You don't become a dog in heat. You become whole persons. And if you could get agreement on that, that, that our deepest, our, our best joys in life have to do with the beauty and the glory and the quality of persons and re relationship with persons and friendships and marriages and f love affairs and people, people then couldn't we command, and God is the best person of all. And then you could spend hours telling him, why? That's why I think we offer the best joy. I think human souls are made like God, and God's soul enjoyed the other persons of the Trinity forever, and our souls are made to find their highest joys in persons, and the greatest persons are the persons of the Trinity, and therefore we offer reconciliation with that God and coming into an everlasting friendship with Jesus. So my, my first point is uh, on the second half, namely it's the goal of missions. We offer them a better joy, and we offer them a longer joy. Now let's just turn for a few minutes to that last point about the energy. I said, joy in Jesus, which I think now is better and longer than any joy anybody could have from anywhere else, is the invincible driving engine of the energy and the aim. And I've just talked about the aim. Now let's just end by talking about energy and power. And how does the joy... It rises and falls that is in your Christian heart. How does the joy in your life energize and empower and sustain and get you to where God wants you to be? That's, that's what we are closing with. I have spoken to you, Jesus said, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And I argue that that means the very joy that Jesus has ultimately in his father, a person, the greatest person, and therefore the greatest joy between the two greatest people in the universe is in you. My joy may be in you and your joy may be full. And I think that's what the Holy Spirit gives us when he bears the fruit of joy. He reveals Christ. He, he is Christ. He's the spirit of Christ in us, mediating to us the joy of Christ in the Father. And my question then is, what did that enable Christ to do? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, the joy that was set before him, for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Here's what I think that means. Jesus in Gethsemane, on his way to Golgotha, on the cross, what prevented him from calling down 12 legions of angels on his enemies and kept him there was that he saw beyond the horrors of the torture through the resurrection to the, the unembattled, unqualified fullness of joy with his father surrounded by the redeemed. And that sight of joy streamed back into the present with mighty power to sustain him in his suffering. 
I think that's what he meant when he said, for the joy that was set before me, I endure the cross. It's not like, I, I don't have any experience of that at all right now. I'm just gutting it out. I don't think so. I think seeing that is a taste of that. Seeing that, it streams back, which is exactly what I think he teaches that the Holy Spirit does for us in the same way from Romans 5, 2. Let me read this to you. So here's Romans 5, 2. We rejoice in hope. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So we're like Jesus. We have a joy set before us. We rejoice in hope. So out there is a, a glory. Out there is a, it's not going to be embattled by my sin anymore. It's not going to be embattled by enemies anymore. It would be uncompromised, undiluted joy in the glory of God forever. I see it and I hope in it. And, and now what? Now what? What effect does that have on me? And the next verse says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Knowing that the suffering produces endurance, the endurance produces character, the character produces hope, and the hope does not put us to shame because the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. So here's, here's my paraphrase and my understanding of how that's working, just like it did for Jesus. We see the hope of the glory of God out there. It fills us with a sense of hope. Oh, that I could have that now. And that hope is a kind of channel by the Spirit by which that joy is flooding back into us, actually transforming sufferings into hope and joy. I mean, what else can it mean when he says, we rejoice in our sufferings? Present tense, not just out there beyond at the hope of the glory of God, but right now, that hope is flowing backwards into history, into my life, just like it did for Jesus. He endured the cross by that joy. I endure my sufferings by that joy. And I think the reason he says you can actually rejoice in them, that is because of them, not just at the same time, because he talks about the effect that they have, and the effect that they have is to unite us more firmly and surely with the hope of glory. That's what he says. And therefore, the way it energizes, the way it sustains is that this glorious future that we have, where it won't be embattled anymore, is seen ever more clearly. And then it streams back and it gives us hope and it gives us joy even in our suffering. So James says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet various trials, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Oh, oh, the need for steadfastness in missions, in any ministry. Steadfastness, 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 perseverance, not just let's try it out and no, that didn't work, that was hard. Steadfastness, steadfastness. Count it all joy when you meet various trials for the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and that should bring joy because steadfastness bears witness that you are real. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you, utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. Undaunted hope. Treasure in heaven when you face suffering. Hebrews 10, 34. This is a picture of what happens when that joy is working in your life. You had compassion on those in prison and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you had a better possession and an abiding one. Better abiding, better and abiding, better and forever. And that knowledge, that future hope, that hope of that glorious treasure of better and abiding streams back into the present and they're able to rejoice that their goods are being plundered because they have shown compassion to the prisoners. That's the power of joy in the life of the missionary. So I, I plead with you that you don't you don't forget that you're taking joy to the nations. It's a wonderful thing. 
to be able to look an unbeliever in the face, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, Jewish, agnostic, atheist, confused, religionist, animist, look every one of them right in the face and say, I exist for your joy. So the joy that sustains and the joy that is our aim. So whether, you, let's end like this. Whether you are looking at 21 martyrs who were beheaded in Libya, or whether you're looking at what, 220 last week abducted Christians in Syria, or whether you're looking at 20 uh, Kachin believers who were killed last year in Myanmar, or whether you're looking at Phyllis Soder, who was kidnapped in Nigeria on Monday, a Methodist missionary in her middle, middle age. We, we checked the internet this afternoon to see if there was an update. Don't see anything yet. So, or whether you're just looking at the increasing hostilities in America towards those who take Christian truth and Christian ways seriously. One thing you know is sure and unshaken. The joy of the Lord is your strength. That's what you know. The joy of the Lord is your strength. It's the joy that we take to the nations and it's the joy that takes us to the nations. That's the easiest way to remember it. It carries us to the nations and we carry it to the nations. That's what we have to give. We, we have the joy to give what we have been given in the risen Christ. So cross exists and I'm praying that thousands of you will exist to rescue people from eternal suffering and to bring them into everlasting joy in friendship with Jesus. So Father, as we move through this evening together, keep joy, the very joy of the Son of God in God before us and grant, I pray, that our hearts would feel it, own it. And I'm asking now, Lord, that all of those watching on the webcast and all of those in this room would ask themselves right now very seriously, am I willing to give my life to that? And I want, I want you to know that 69-year-old John Piper who can do anything he wants because Uncle Sam's going to pay for all the bills from here on out. Should he, should he go? I do mean that, Lord. I'm, I don't want to be grandstanding here. I want my wife to know this. I want these friends to know this. We, I am available. If there's another thing you want me to do besides what I'm doing by way of mobilization, I'm available. And I, I'm asking you and I'm asking God in your presence to grant that you would be vulnerable for the rest of this evening to God's call on your life.